Okay. Let's call this church family. You know, this feels funny to be way up here. Hold on. Yeah. My megaphone. Yeah, I've washed my hands three times since the sermon this morning. <laughs> Passed by the, the pump, the hand sanitizer. No, it wasn't Pastor Julian. I, um, I, I, hope, I hope you were as blessed as I was by him and his sermon. Yeah. I received three texts from folks who were just thanking me and for us for, for allowing him to preach here and wanting him to come back. So I keep sending those texts to Julian. And then I realized, all you get next week is just me. I should have... I should have planned this better. So no, but it's. Uh, I think it's really not only is he a, a, a godly guy and a good, very gifted preacher, but I think it's really important. Um, in, in case you're, this is not part of the official agenda of the meeting, but it's important to say, and that is when we had Pray Fox Valley in this room, and then a second kind of round of it. Some of you were here for that. I really felt convicted by God that sometimes when you're a larger church, which we are, and you're. Uh, you don't have budget struggles, which we don't, you know, we have some, but it's not, they're not crushing like some churches. And you can fall into the myth of thinking that, well, we don't really need anybody else. We're doing our thing for God our way. And being with these other pastors and churches, I really was convicted that if God's going to do what he wants to do in our region, it's not just going to be through Chapel Street Church. It's going to be by all God's people coming together who are aligned in the gospel. And uh, Julian's become a dear brother in the Lord, and I'm just thrilled they got to preach to you. And more importantly, I think it communicates the right thing to our church family that we know about, love, and care about what God's doing in other places in the community. So I talked to another friend of mine who's a pastor in the Wheaton area. Our sons are teammates and roommates at Wheaton College. And so I think it's a pastor support group that he's in. My son is in with these other players that have pastors for dads. But anyway, uh, this guy was asking me, he says, who's preaching in your church? And I told him. And he said, well, where is he from? I said, well, just down in Aurora. You mean he's regional, local? I said, oh, yeah. He says, that would never happen he around here. Everybody's too competitive and too afraid of, 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 of churches stealing people. Like, you know. And I thought, what a shame. God's kingdom is so much bigger. And so I, I hope you celebrate that like I do. Yes. I am, uh, my wife and I, if you're a Facebook, I know Pastor Julian railed against Facebook, but uh, there, there are some good things occasionally on there, not, not political things, but other things. And uh, if you followed, you saw perhaps some of my posts that my wife and I were in Africa. We got back just a, a little over a week ago. And if you're wondering about that, you'll, you'll hear stories. I'm sure a year from now, you'll be like, we get it. You went to Africa, find some new illustrations. But, but let me just tell you a couple of things that were really profound. If you're wondering why we went... We went uh, to, because our, our church supports Cure International. Cure is uh, putting first world hospitals in third world countries. Uh, that's their mission. And you might remember the story of Amanda Good and Fred, the little boy Fred, who she worked with in Rwanda. Fred was missing a leg and had a horribly deformed other leg, and it was the Cure Hospital in Kenya that did that surgery for Fred. We have supported the hospital in Uganda and the one in Zambia, um, and that's where we were, in Zambia. And... You know, we saw Victoria Falls, which were breathtaking and overwhelming. It's like, it's like uh, Niagara Falls stretched out for 1.2 miles. It's just overwhelming. We saw, went on safari and saw the animals, but by far the most profound impact for my wife and for me was the people working in the cure, the children, the families, the staff. Sometimes I think we give to things. You don't know, like, where's all that money going on a, on a foreign mission? Is it making a difference? I can tell you without reservation or hesitation, they're changing lives every day. Uh, their stated mission is from Luke 9, 2. Preach the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom of God, and heal the sick. That, that's, that's Luke 9, 2. That's the mission. Preach the good news of the kingdom and heal the sick. And they're doing both. And one without the other doesn't get it done. If you only preach good news but do nothing for people's needs, you don't earn the right to be heard. But if you only meet physical needs and never tell them about the healing of their soul, and we talked about this as a staff this week, I was just so struck by that because even though it's a very different context, that's exactly what we're about here what the Neighborhood Church vision is about, to preach the good news of the kingdom and to meet practical, tangible needs of the people that are our neighbors. Um, so I was very grateful to go. I want to say thank you to you as a church family for affording me and allowing me. Uh, you, you didn't pay for all of it, but that's not what I mean. <laughs> what I mean is you, uh, you be in a kind of place where I could do that and have that experience. It was so, uh, such a gift. And to do it with my wife was also a great, great gift. One of the things in this... There'll be a point, hopefully. I'm a little, I, do, I haven't had any jet lag, but I've been a little bit wound up, my wife said, so maybe I have like the reverse of jet lag. I got hyper, <laughs> which is maybe not good for me. Um, we, the first day we were there was that we were, it was a Sunday, well, we flew into Dubai, which is the craziest place in, on the earth. It's just 
but we'll leave that for another time. And then we flew to Lusaka, the capital city of Zambia, and Sunday morning was our first full day there. We went to church with a little church called the Tubalenge Congregation. That's a word in Nyanja that means show them by your love. It means show them. Uh, so we went to this congregation. You might have seen a post where they're worshiping. It's about a two, two and a half hour service, so unlike Julian, where we, but we, they're not very regimented on time. Um, the most profound thing happened to me in that service. They're worshiping in, in a, English is a national language, but nobody really speaks it. And so they're worshiping in their tribal language. And a guy named Harold, who I'll tell you about another time, was whispering in my ear what they're saying. And about a third of their worship was giving. They had these buckets up front. One said widows and orphans, one said the children's wing, one said, I forget what else, but four or five buckets. And then an empty space. And section by section, with these songs and drums, they would come forward dancing and singing, waving their money in the air to put it in the bucket and then dance their way and sing their way back to their seats. And this went on for conservatively 25 to 30 minutes. And none of it was like, look at me, look what I'm giving. Like the widow's might. it wasn't bragging. It was praising God that they had the privilege to give. I was weeping watching this. It was so overwhelming to me. And then they have this section where they give food. Some of the people in the congregation don't have cash to give. They give, so they're, they're dancing down the aisle with like a 60 pound bag of Enchima meal. Enchima is this, it's like grits, but worse. And they, they're, they're carrying this bag and dropping it in cooking oil. And then they, at the end of the service, they gave this to widows and orphans in the church family. But it just struck me that, you know, we live in a congregation where for many of us, many people that we interact with, your finances is the final frontier in your spiritual life. God can have a hold of me other places, but that's, that's like the last frontier, you know, for God's grace to get a hold of us. Me too. And just to watch these people who have, no, on, a, on, a, on a comparative scale, nothing. To just to, to come down, dance down the aisle giving their gifts to God was so convicting and humbling to me. And, um, and you might hear that story again next week because it's generosity and grace is the sermon. Um, anyway, I wanted to share that with you. And it reminded me of why we're doing what we're doing. This little church, they talked, it was remarkable. I mean, you ever notice that sometimes when you're paying attention to things, like certain things that there's coincidences that, you, that aren't really coincidences? I've used the analogy before. I'm driving a Honda Element. I bought it for my dad because they moved to Arizona and he doesn't need it. And I realized, and I, now I notice there's a lot more Honda Elements on the road since I've been driving one. Do you think that's true? <laughs> no, I'm not a trendsetter. People aren't buying more used Honda Elements, right? I just see them now. I just see them now because I'm in one. And I think talking about the neighborhood impact vision, talking about being a church that exists not just for ourselves but for our neighbors has caused me to see and hear things differently. I hope it has for you. And being in this church, listening to the way they're talking, I was struck by they're talking about the same things. They want to make a difference with their neighbors in neighboring villages. The, the pastor who preached said, don't you throw food away. Don't throw food away. I know some of you are doing it. Don't do it. Here's where you can bring it. You know, did you ever grow up when your mom said there are starving children in Africa? We were with them. They are. <laughs> and he's saying, don't throw food away. And it just struck me. They're trying, to make, they're trying to use what resources they have to make an impact in the area in which God has placed them, which is precisely what we're doing. So I wanted to begin this meeting. Well, we've already begun. But to start now by showing you this video. It's, uh, it's a video some of you have, we've all seen if you were here for the launch of the Neighborhood Impact Campaign. But I think it'll be a good reminder for us of what we're doing and why. And then I'll come back up and talk about some of the specifics that we're facing. So roll it, D. Start that again with sound. I would, I don't remember it. You are here. I should. Are here. But have you ever stopped to consider why you live in your neighborhood, on your street, or in your house? What if it's not just about meeting your needs, about good school systems, affordability, and proximity to your work? What if instead it's about the faces and names of your neighbors? What if it's less about you and more about impacting the lives of those around you? God has placed our church right where it is for the very same reason, so that together we can reach our neighbors for Christ. This is our neighborhood as a church, 
and it's home to more than 600,000 names and faces. And over 50% of them say they have no connection to a church at all. That is every other person you meet. They are the reason we are here. Since the opening of our West Campus, our ability to love and serve the neighbors within our reach has grown immensely. Our Shepherd's Heart Care Center started out as just a closet of extra food and now serves nearly a thousand people every month. Our Masterpiece Ministries reach and serve dozens of families of children with special needs in our community. And our women's ministry is expanding rapidly, reaching more and more women and they have outgrown our current facilities. We are increasingly becoming a church not for ourselves, but for our neighbors. And as we've grown, we've had to ask ourselves the question, is our greatest impact going to happen by building bigger and bigger facilities? Rather than investing in any one campus to make it significantly larger, we believe we must reproduce ourselves by strategically placing campuses in the communities we are already poised to reach. We are convinced that God is leading us toward becoming a family of neighborhood churches committed to transforming lives and impacting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Neighborhood Impact is an initiative to strategically expand and multiply our gospel impact through establishing neighborhood churches. We have a goal to raise $6.2 million over the next three years. This money will be used to renovate and expand the Mill Creek campus, to renovate and improve our West Campus, and to expand the capacity of Shepherd's Heart at our East Campus. However, Neighborhood Impact means much more than just raising money or adding another facility. It means we must intentionally develop new leaders in all areas of ministry. We've already begun this through our Leadership Institute and are expanding it through the new Pastoral Residency Program. It also means developing new opportunities, keeping our eyes open for communities in need and cultivating hearts of compassion that can see the opportunities emerging for gospel impact. Ministries like our Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry, Masterpiece Ministry, our Support and Care Ministries have been reaching the unique needs of our neighbors and we're only just beginning. Most importantly, it means more people transformed by the gospel and committed to loving, serving, and reaching their neighbors for Christ. It means people like Laura and Jeff, who started a Bible study in their own neighborhood to reach those who are far from God, but right next door. It means men like Scott, who God has taken from a nominal churchgoer to a leader sold out to serving his community. And Christine, who came to us in a time of great brokenness and need, and now has a passion to impact the lives of others who are hurting. It means couples like Amanda and Nick, who experience the love of God's people reaching out to them during the toughest 48 hours of their lives. It means people like you. You see, we cannot do this without you. You are the gospel agent in your home, on your street, in your neighborhood. There are 300,000 people right around us who do not know the hope of the gospel. What could God do if everyone watching this committed to loving and serving their neighbors? This is what Neighborhood Impact is all about. It's about the gospel, the church, the neighborhood, and you. I like watching that. I hope you do as well. That's right. Not because it's my voice. You know, you, that's, I don't know how you feel, but uh, that feels like a lifetime ago that we recorded that. So much is happening so fast. And I really mean this. When we came back from Africa, coming back to work on Monday, going and visiting the Kessler campus and here and seeing the refrigeration units in, in, in Shepherd's Art here and then visiting Mill Creek and seeing the progress that, you know, for a whole 10 days had gone by, it struck me, and, and I mean that the construction became a symbol for me that this is happening. It's going to happen. You know, it's gone from kind of an idea, a vision, maybe this is a good idea, let's see if God's in this, to I really believe this, this is happening and God's going to bless it and, I'm, and I get more and more excited about it. So um, I want to talk a little bit and bring Sterling up, if you would, Sterling, about the, what, what has happened, what is happening, what's going to happen as it relates to the launch team and the preparation to actually be a worshiping congregation out there at Mill Creek. So you'll have the timeline as you go. Yeah, just for a little bit of background, um, I think they've got some key dates that are going to come up here on the screen, potentially. But, okay, the timeline. Timeline? Um, so, yeah, here's, here's just kind of the progress that's, that's begun. Shortly after, about this time last year, after the annual meeting, 
um, and the church approving uh, the acquisition of the Mill Creek campus. And um, we began to work and, and put together the staff, which we've introduced to all of you, my, in addition to myself, um, Ali Goble, Eric Elfman, and Libby uh, Tate will be going to lead the ministries over at the Mill Creek campus. By December, we had our first meeting with different families that both live in the community, that were somewhere in the Worship Cafe community that had ministered alongside of Eric and I. Some were just people that we knew that expressed interest. We began to spread word and say, hey, can we share with you the vision of, of what's going to take place? Out of that meeting, um, with those families, we said, we're looking for you to, to commit. And by the middle of January, I think January 8th was the date that families begin to say, hey, we're in. We're in on this. And as families said, we're in on this, more families begin to say, hey, we're feeling called to this, or can you tell me more? And sitting down over breakfast and lunch and sharing the vision for this. Um, throughout the last several months, um, as you'll see, we began... Um, as, as construction was all unfolding during this time, we began to meet and to train and to prepare as a launch team. Uh, Laura Taro led the, the Mill Creek launch team, and I know many of you, through the Neighborhood Impact Training Seminar, the, the seminar on neighboring and how do we love our neighbor and what does this look like individually and collectively, we met to begin to describe the serving opportunities um, last February and say, um, here's where we need people, and w what do you feel like God's calling you to, which was just so, it was so exciting to have this group of people sitting there listening to you, and all of them looking and saying, we're in, w what's the need, how do I serve, what, where do we get plugged in? Um, it, 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 Jeff and I have talked about this many times, but one of the most exciting elements of all this for me is seeing the us as Chapel Street own this, and saying this is what it's going to take to make this happen and watching people step up and seeing leaders emerge. It's been an incredibly humbling and encouraging thing. In May, the same team of people, when Mill Creek hosts their annual garage sale, went out to deliver what we called garage sale care packages. So in addition to the Mill Creek campus serving as a location where those families that are coming to shop could stop and get a map and, and get something to drink and just meet people that way, we went to all throughout the neighborhood and just met the families that were, were hosting the garage sales. We had a little care package that we dropped off, which was information about the church and snacks and a cold frappuccino, which that seemed to do the trick. It was the frappuccino that seemed to... Uh... But incredible conversations where people are like, oh, we've seen the construction. Tell us what's going on. And we're excited about you guys being in the neighborhood. Um, really felt like God opened some some doors there. And all of that has led us now to where we're at, um, where next week we will begin, we will meet for the first time as a launch team um, in what we call the incubation stage. We'll, these families will be gathered down the hall in our student center. Um, we'll have children's ministry running downstairs. Um, I'm going to preach this first week, and we're going to begin to, to uh, work together as a team to run ministry all preparing for our, our launch on October 1st. On September 17th and 24th, we will then transplant out to the new campus. It's supposed, scheduled to open on September 15th. Our first service, just as a launch team, will be on the 17th. We'll do that again on the 24th. Um, again, we have some events planned where we're inviting neighbors in, uh, meeting with us. And then on October 4th, uh, in addition to this launch team and our friends and neighbors, we're inviting the Mill Creek community and those surrounding to come join us as we, as we worship God, as we experience him together and invite them uh, into a relationship with him. So we, we could not be more excited about um, all that has led up. And I will say this real quickly. Um, the amount of, so I cannot tell you the, the number of times somebody has come up and said, hey, we are praying for you. Or I was out in the parking lot praying over the church, or I was walking around and just asking God to move in, in the neighborhood. I've actually had conversations with people that are not from Chapel Street, who don't attend our church, who said, I have a, a very real sense that the Holy Spirit is, is going to do something in and through your church. This, this uh, neighborhood impact that you all are a part of is, is, is going to impact people for the gospel. And I'm just like, just humbled by the whole thing. And so thank you for your support, your encouragement, for your prayers. 
Um, we need it and we love it and, and we feel very much like this is not us going to go do this thing. This is all of us collectively as Chapel Street Church saying, hey, we want to be a part of, of reaching people for Jesus. So, You could hear his excitement, and I'm, I share it. A um, couple things just to reiterate. One, you'll see that September 10th is commissioning. Then that's, there will not be an incubation service. We'll have the Chapel Street kind of core teams, whoever can be serviced, to come on stage and pray as a church family at each of our services for them as we commission them to go. And then the 24th um, is an open house. Food trucks... I don't know, fire trucks, clowns, balloons, King Kong, whatever you have out there. We'll be out at uh, Mill Creek, uh, kind of a community event, open house to come and, and, and have some food and fellowship and hear about it when it launches the next week, October 1st. So continue to pray that construction stays on schedule. Um, my son, Benjamin, is working to get his hours in for his driver's license, and so one of the things we've taken to do now is drive out to Mill Creek, get out of the car, walk around, pray for what God's going to do there, and then he drives us back home, and I pray each time he drives as well. So... <laughs> No, but it's been good. So um, let me pause now uh, and, and let, let, let's, any questions specifically, because we're going to talk about the financial part of the campaign and some other things, but let me just pause here and say, do you, anybody have any questions or want to make any comments about the preparation of the Mill Creek team, uh, staff, families, and, and the launch and the plans that you've heard about and seen? Any questions on that issue? Maybe this is old news to all of you. Andy. I don't think I need a microphone. I don't think you do. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of that has been well, one of the target um, groups that we sought to be a part of the launch team has been our has been families in Chapel Street Church who live in Mill Creek. So a lot of it has been very relational, personal people that live there who have been talking to their neighbors and their friends about what's going on. But in addition to that, we are also, so as we get closer, we are canvassing the neighborhood to make personal invites to say, hey, we want you to come on the 24th. There's going to be food trucks there, and we just want you to be our guests and come experience it and, uh, and be a part of it, and we want to be able to invite you back then on October 1st. On a more um, broad scale, we've been doing things, and we'll continue to do things via Facebook, uh, mailings, that sort of thing, say, hey, let you know a church is coming. But we realize our primary efforts are in personal relational asks. So, and that will be actually kind of amping up even now that, yeah. that the, uh, the campus is getting closer to opening. Yeah, so but we're thinking that um, if your life is like mine, you, don't pay, you get something three, four, six weeks in advance, it doesn't always register. So we're thinking about a month out, we'll ramp up the like, door hangers and mailings and that kind of thing so people are excited in the window in which they're paying attention to it to attend. But that's a, that's a, there's a good question. Same. Deer path. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we've identified several neighborhoods. And then also really, I think, reiterating with our team of people, like I don't, I don't live in Tanglewood or Mill Creek or any of those, but I, I am inviting my neighbors. It's so individually, it's me looking at my neighborhood and saying, hey, I would love to invite you all to be a part of this and to come experience it and hang out with us. And then collectively as a church, looking at where God has placed us and saying, we want to corporately invite the community around us to be a part of, of what God's doing. And that is a good segue, actually, something I wanted to mention. And that is that, you know, I think there's, there's a tendency to think, oh, that's good for them. They're going to do this. When, remember when Sterling talked about those that are committing to be part of the launch team, signing up to serve, be part of it, kind of like, you want to be in on this? It's required that you serve. It's required that you're in a group. Uh, that's my heart as your pastor. That's not just for them. That's for us. So on October, or no, excuse me, on August 20th and 27th, we're going to be distributing these sort of launch cards for all of us. But here's the idea. The idea is anyone can attend any campus they want to. We're not requiring you to be in a radius of where you live to go to a campus. We would encourage you to live in a place where you can invest in your neighbors and to worship near there, but we're not going to require that. What we do want is you to tell us where is your place of worship going to be. Where are you going to plug in, put down roots, and serve and make that your home and, your, and, and make a difference there? I think it would be a shame if we have a bunch of curiosity seekers the, uh, the month of October that fill that place with all of us, and there's no room for those who want to come visit. So I'm going to encourage a whole church family, pick the place, prayerfully decide which, which campus is going to be your campus as a family. Let us know that. In addition, if you're not already serving, indicate for us the areas of interest you have, because we, we want to use this for all of us 
to begin to think about reaching our neighbors and serving in the same way. But anyway, yes, Meredith. So, the three locations, does that mean that there are the same opportunities for each one? Are you supposed to go to one for early rising and the other for early? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I th- perhaps I don't, but I'm going to pretend that I do. Um, there's not the same exact, so it's not a traditional service at every campus. There's not a contemporary service exactly the same at every campus. There's not the same adult learning communities at every campus. So no, that, that's not the case. It just as it isn't the case now. So we're not, our intent has never been to do everything that we do on every campus exactly the same. But to do worship, vibrant worship, you know, solid, good children's ministries, group life, and that's, those, those three things need to be present on each campus. Yeah. And then come back to sure. Right. Well, in that case, I, 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 early risers may or may not stay at the Kesslinger campus. That's still being determined where the best long-term place is for them. There's nothing precluding you from doing that. Yeah. Which would you say now is your campus, your place of worship? West. Probably West. Okay. Well, then. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to dictate how people determine that. And there's nothing wrong with going to a class here and going to a worship service there. Uh, but, but I think, anyway, I won't belabor the point. But we're not planning to have everything repeated at every campus. Bill. Yeah. Right. Good question. Okay. It, for those of you that didn't hear, uh, Bill asked, what's the allocation of pastoral staff? How's that going to work right now? You know, we, we rotate in terms of preaching, I presume you're mostly talking about. I just spent the last week since I've been back working out the uh, matrix for the preaching plan. It is going to be fun. So, <laughs> you know, we said from the outset, we don't want to have predominantly video preaching. We want to do mostly live preaching. We want the capacity on occasion to do video when it strategically meets our needs, but we want to do, raise up live preachers. Our preaching team right now is four. There's three campuses and multiple venues. And so it's, the intent is that Sterling, in the, especially in the beginning, would be predominantly there, but not exclusively there. That Brian and I will be rotating through different campuses. And Andrew will be preaching more than he has now, but not as much as the other three of us. Because he's, by the way, how fun is that to see? I don't know if you caught this, but Andrew, when we talked about our pastoral residency program in the video, he was the guy standing up there, pastoral resident. Now he's on our staff. I think God is blessing these efforts in lots of ways, so. Yes. Look at his look at his shiny red head. Okay, that's a good question. So the intent is not to have surely only there, me only here, and Brian only somewhere else. That we would still have presence at all campuses. But I think you'll if you're here, you'll see less of Sterling in the first six months or so. Glenn. Yes. Okay. Another good question. Um, we have gotten away, this is a little bit like confession time. Brian had the foresight and wisdom to say, let's get double mileage out of our preparation in preaching. We've done that for years. So I could preach it one, prepare, preach it, and then preach it again the next week, which is nice. You get a week off of preparing, you're just sort of tweaking. Those days are over. So <laughs> that ship has sailed. It's just, it would be so hard to do it if, we were, if we're swapping t- um, subjects. You'd be three or four weeks removed, and we wouldn't be aligned, and it would be confusing. And I have no doubt, in a very short order, some of us would be showing up to campuses and preaching the wrong thing, and it would get confusing. So w- starting in the fall, the intent is that all of us would be hearing the same text and the same thr- thrust of the text at every campus. I won't say the exact same sermon, because Sterling might be preaching it his way and me my way, but you'd be hearing from Hebrews chapter 2 the same message, you know, not central thrust of it. So we'll be aligned as a church family that way. I won't say there wouldn't ever be a time when Saturday night might be one week off to give us a reprieve and preaching schedule, but we're not going to have East and West, to use the old names, on different Topics, we're all going to be aligned more often than not in the future. Good question, Glenn. Thank you. This is prompting more questions. Clark. Okay. Yeah. Okay, if I understand correctly, you're talking about the incubation period when we're meeting here at the, at the uh, South Street campus. 
Correct. Yes. Downstairs will be filled with, with kids, a portion of which will be Mill Creek launch team families and their kids and serving down there as well. Uh, Libby Tate and uh, Pastor Chris Saros have worked on a plan about how they're staffing those and who's covering what. And now three of those, three of the five weeks are the weeks when typically in children's ministry, what we call a family weekends, they're in the services with us. Everyone but the Mill Creek team will be doing that. We will run Sunday school in order to, to practice um, and, and do that sort of thing. Then on um, September 3rd will be our last Sunday of incubation. And September 10th will be in the services for commissioning. And then beginning on September 17th, those families would, would be out at the Mill Creek campus, if that makes sense. So the short answer is yes, on October 1st, though, you'll have less children here, or actually before that when they go out there on the 17th of September than you had prior to that, because some of them will go. Uh, you know, because I, I just totally adore this Scottish Grove, I'm <laughs> recording all the preaching of the different services and preaching all of those. So if you're preaching, if you're on the wall, you're preaching one Sunday on the same topic, and I like yours, but I want to hear what Andrew had to say, will there be a way for that? Would, yeah, right. only mine. No, <laughs> no, that's funny. Um, so here, uh, we are in the process of looking for a tech director. Randall Mason, who's still part of our church family, took a new, another job. And so I want to be cautious in promising something. My intent would be we'd be recording every sermon on every campus and making those available. However, I want, don't want to overpromise for our overworked tech department right now. We may not be able to do that initially. Yet I think it would be fun for you to compare notes and say, Andrew got this totally wrong. <laughs> Jeff said. <laughs> okay. Uh, we could, we'll have more time at the end. Let's move on to uh, the next section. I want to talk through some of where we are in neighborhood impact fi fun financials. You saw a brief bit of, about this in a video a couple of weeks ago, but I want to just bring us up to speed on where things are right now. And then if you're a member, you received an email or a letter highlighting one particular issue we're facing in the short term. And so we'll, we'll talk about that now. So as you remember, $6.2 million is a neighborhood impact project, and that includes, I think the next image will show you what it includes, the $5.3 million are construction costs proper, uh, architecture fees around $400,000 in the Mill Creek mortgage, which pre-existed, which we absorbed at a half a million dollars. And that's where the 6.2 comes from. Now, there were a few, like we were required by the state to add ADA access uh, at our stage. There were a few costs that were not back when we first began, but they're minor. And I want to tell you with absolute certainty, the costs have not substantially changed. So I, I can't say they haven't changed one penny because we were required to do a couple of things for a, a 30,000 here and 50,000 there that, that, that sounds funny to say it that way, but that, were, that we didn't anticipate in the beginning. But that hasn't changed. So that's very important to keep that in mind. 6.2 is still the number, it's still the project. We haven't substantially added to that uh, by our, our changes. Next slide will show you. Uh, Coming out of the, the, the campaign, which was the, the initiative uh, back in, the, in starting in, in 2016 and into 17, was the, uh, the pledges. We have come out of that with $4.3 million in pledges over three years. I feel very good about that, excited about that. That lines up almost exactly with what we received initially in pledges from our Growing to Serve campaign. You might remember that one, which produced the, which just got us to this point in a very real way. So we're, we are excited about that. I should also tell you, uh, over the course of the Growing to Serve campaign, over the three years post pledges, we saw over one million dollars of unpledged money come in from those who maybe weren't part of our church when we started, or didn't pay attention and got motivated and, and God moved their heart to give. And we anticipate more of the same. In fact, we're already seeing that. But that's where that is. And so we have received, I believe this number is a little bit low now, $200,000. Oh, go ahead. There you go. Yeah, you had it. In unpledged gifts. That means those who didn't make a pledge commitment but have already written checks uh, toward the project. This does not include those who have given toward their pledge already. So total giving toward the project, we have about 1.4, is that right, Fred? $1.4 million, including unpledged gifts and pledged gifts already in. We feel great about that. That's, this is all really good news. And by the way, we're on track to hit $4 million as a general fund budget for the first time in our church's history. Now, we're a little bit, running a little bit under, but still, I mean, sometimes I, you look at numbers, you think, well, there's a gap here, there's a gap there. But the truth is, things are up and to the right uh, in terms of our growth as a church and our finances as a church. And we praise God for that. And I, and I thank all of you for your generosity and covet your continued prayers for that. Um, this means we have a gap of $1.7 million. And that's the next slide, I believe. There you go. Yeah. 
We have a gap of 1.7 million. Now, just to give you a little context here, uh, if we got an, if we received no other money in than what's pledged, if no other mo more money came in, that would be the gap. Uh, we anticipate that to come down significantly. In fact, we received some encouraging news just this past week that it looks like that's going to gap's going to shrink drastically. My, but the point is, even if that d didn't happen, this would be the, the service on this debt would be less than what we were paying monthly for the Growing to Serve debt if we come out of this. That's not preferable, but just to give you some context, we're not in a position even now, if no more money comes in, that this is long-term going to be a problem uh, for us. We'd like to come out of it in three years debt-free, and we're trusting God and praying for that, but we do feel good about where we're headed. The issue is, in the meantime, that our current giving on pledges and unpledges has not kept pace with our need to draw on our construction loan in the short term. I'm going to do my best to explain this because Doug is went to Seattle, of all things. Um, we got your permission as a church family, voted for permission to give us uh, permission to draw up to $4 million as a construction loan, which would be converted to a mortgage once the project was completed. Uh, that was our looking bit past history and our, and our best efforts to forecast what we would need. It's now evident that we're going to need to go over that $4 million in the short term. This is purely a timing and a cash flow issue. The project hasn't changed. We haven't added things secretly to the project at all. But the giving toward the project in, in the first half of year one hasn't, hasn't uh, exceeded our need to draw uh, up that $4 million. We think it'll probably be between four hundred and six hundred thousand dollars, roughly, that we'll need that we'll go over. But we're asking at the annual meeting in August for permission to basically get another line of credit up to a million. We don't want to undersell it, you know. We would only pay interest on that which we borrow, not anymore, and this would all be rolled into the same mortgage that we would have for the whole project when, it, when it's over, and it would not any, add any additional cost to the project long term. I hope I'm doing a good job explaining this, and I hope it's your understanding where I'm coming from. The main thing I want to communicate is the project hasn't changed. We feel good about God's provision and the trajectory we're on, but in the short term, the timing cash flow issue, we have a need to borrow a little more money to make sure we pay out all of our debts for construction. Let me pause there, and uh, Dave's here and Fred's here and others have asked. You can ask any questions you want uh, about the finances so far because we have a little more to talk about in a minute, but questions about that. My wife uh, understood this when we got the email. She's like, oh, I get it. I was like, you do? That's fantastic. Because <laughs> this is the kind of thing, if you're only barely paying attention, you could come across in a way that people might easily misunderstand, that, which is really the impetus to have this meeting, to celebrate what God's doing to make sure that we're on the same page heading into the annual meeting. Any questions about that? Um, interest rate? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Right. From a perspective, you're just going to borrow a little more. In the short term. Yes, that's right, Andy. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now, um, uh, Ray, sorry. No. No. No larger mortgage. It gets all rolled together. We only pay on what we borrow. In fact, um, if some of the indications we receive, I received this past week, this may not be as big an issue as we thought it would be. God seems to be moving in some people that are, are want to be generous toward it. So, But it, it was really what it came down to was either this or we deplete our cash reserves as a church, which is a very unwise thing to do. And that's why we're coming saying, hey, this is what we're facing in the short term. It doesn't change the long-term mortgage debt or where our trajectory in, in our financial health. I would love, and I encourage you to pray for this, that... People continue to get in the game. I think if, if God is in this and we see people coming to Christ and coming to faith and experiencing grace and making an impact at, at Mill Creek and all of our campuses, we're going to see more people want to be involved in this. I want to keep this in front of us, the church family, not out of guilt or obligation, but celebrating what God's doing. And I anticipate that we'll see this, this gap continue to, to close. But this is the current reality. So thanks for that question. Others? Yes. Jan and then Clark. Uh, well, I, I'll say it the other, the other way around. We, we were coached that we would, should plan but on between 8 and 10% of attrition that don't come in. And that was exactly what we saw in Growing to Serve. 
just under 10%, about the same. Uh, that was more than offset by those who gave that didn't pledge. And so what we're planning, are, are, you know, Doug and Fred and their, their models incorporate all of that into it. Yes. Yes. It is. There's still, uh, I don't know what the mortgage, there's still, still, still money coming in toward that. That is shrinking, that mortgage is shrinking down and will be com com converted eventually to combined. But for now, it's still a, a giving destination for people that are still paying on their pledges. Even though the, the, we ended in December, right? There's still people that are fulfilling their pledges and that's why it still exists as a line on the envelope. But you're right, that was the name of the old. That won't be there much longer. Clark. Well, it's not all in. That's pledged money. Well, we are going to. Yeah, we're going to. So we're right in the thick of the paying out phase. And so the timing, I think the sequence, the timing is such that if we get approval in August, we're paying into September. We haven't paid, drawn all the $4 million, but it, it looks like we're going to. And so it's not just the $4 million. We have $1.4 in. That's $5.4 million. And if the total project is 6.2. You get, uh, my math is right, you get the, uh, so it's not just, if, if we get more contributions in, that'll reduce our need to draw anything, to borrow anything. We hope that's true. You ever see the old Chevy Chase bit when he's the president talking at, at, a, at a press conference and they say, Mr. President, could you explain the deficit and the, with the, the foreign budgets? And he's like, it's my understanding there would be no math. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I feel right now. <laughs> Don't ask me too many more questions. Fred! That's right. Others. Okay, next slide, D. Thank you. This shows you a little bit of our pledges. 374 people for 4.32 million. That's a pretty good ratio in terms of the, the average pledge there. Now, obviously, that's offset by some people that have means and been very generous, but still, we feel good about that, that ratio there. Next one shows those are pledged contributions. Just put the whole thing up there. Sorry, D. So uh, $1.24 million in right now, that doesn't include the 200,000 that's unpledged that's in. That's 28, nearly almost 30% now of the total, which is good. Unpledged contributions, you see that there. Total people engaged, 504. We didn't crack the 500 mark in Growing to Serve, so we feel great about that. So these are all good things. The truth is, last time in Growing to Serve, we didn't do anything until the, we had the pledges in, but to, in order to get ready to launch, to kind of catch the wave and launch Mill Creek in the fall, we did, we did the order differently. And our forecasting was just off by several hundred thousand dollars in terms of our need to borrow. That's what this comes down to. And I wanted to be sure that you, we were clear about that. Yes. Yes. No, you're giving units. So the, a, a pledge from the Cheney family. Yes, right, sorry, that's correct. 504 I individuals, not, I mean, giving units, not individuals. Unless you split your pledge up between the two of you and divide it in half, then we count you both, right? I had a, a, a meeting with a, a good friend of mine as a pastor. He was talking about um, the challenges of finances in the contemporary suburban church. And he said, um, he met with this guy who was a man of great, great wealth and been very generous in the past and a good friend. And he, you know, they've been talking about the vision to, of their church's initiative for months, the same kind of things we did, you know, videos and emphasis and talking and trying to motivate people and catch them catch why. And his good friend never gave anything and he couldn't figure it out. And they had breakfast and he said, it finally felt like God prompted him, I gotta ask this guy, you know, what, why? Is it, is, you, know, you start to play tricks in your mind as a pastor. Does he not like me? Does he not believe in this? What's the problem? Is he not getting it? So he sat down and he said, just, why haven't you gotten involved? I'm not presuming that you should, or I'm not, I just, why? And his friend said, oh, you need my help? And he went, yeah, six months of talking about it every week. But this guy, who was kind of a world traveler, and in 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 said, oh, I figured if you needed my help, you would ask me. You would ask me. And he said, well, I'm asking. <laughs> and the guy wrote him a very generous check. So I, I, don't, I, I tell you that story because it was encouraging to me. I think sometimes people are just barely paying attention to things that I'm thinking about every day, all day. And I want to encourage you, if you've been generous to this, thank you. It's a huge encouragement, and God's going to bless it. If you haven't, that's between you and God, but let me urge you to get involved. Get involved. It's going to make a difference. 
Someday we're going to look back on this meeting, these meetings, the way we are looking back. on. You know, we're going to celebrate. It's going to be a year since we had a senior pastor transition. That's crazy to me. It's been a year almost already, and all that God has done. Someday we're going to look back on this and say, remember when we were dreaming and striving and planning, and look at now all that God has done. I, I, I get excited about that day. And it's the same vision here as it is in Zambia and all over the world that God has for his church. So um, there, are, there are no more agenda items. I could, like Pastor Julian, just ramble on for a while, but it is a beautiful day, and perhaps we should wrap it up unless there are any other questions you have. Yes, Tom. Oh, construction-wise? Oh, thank you, Tom. Yeah, I, could, I should do that. Uh, is John Harper here? That guy never sleeps anyway. He, needs, he deserves some time off. So we are on track for a, um, if you were at our Kessinger campus this morning, or if you haven't been there, go by there every week. It's kind of new to see what's happening. That is supposed to be done and ready for full ministry use next weekend. Um, we'll have, a, yeah, that's exciting. Really exciting. Um, there, I think we're going to have a little bit of a delay in the nursery area uh, based on, you know, they haven't told us that, but I'm guessing we're, they're a little bit delayed there still. So, But uh, the Global Leadership Summit will be ho simulcast hosting again on August 10th and 11th, and I encourage you, if you're not already signed up, that's a great use of your time and developing your leadership skills. It'll, it, our goal was to have it prior to that, so we're ready to roll. Uh, so that's really exciting, um, and that's all going to be wrapped up. Um, there's, you know, there's always little bugs to work out, but we feel good about that. Um, if you've not been over there, I'm going to encourage you to go by some weekend or midweek and look at the nursery space. We added no square footage, but I, John walked me through that on Tuesday this week. I was stunned. It looks like we've added hundreds of square feet, and, and we have it. It really is amazing. Just by reconfiguring that, that, that area and, and how we use it, we've gained lots of ministry space for children and, and, and infants and toddlers. So, oh, and hang in there. We're almost done. He's laying down in the front pew here. <laughs> yes, right, that's right. You, you're going to get ice cream for sure on the way home, right, Dad? <laughs> anyway, he's, he's like, oh. uh, at, at Here at, at, at uh, South Street Campus, right downstairs, Shepherd's Heart. Now, initially, we had put a placeholder for $100,000 for the project here. We've been able to accomplish all of that for right around $60,000 that we intended on this campus, and, which is really exciting. We got these refrigeration units in. I know Erin and her team are thrilled about that. You've probably seen some some social media posts about that. We have new furniture in the waiting area for people and their children. Um, and we have new storage area that we're reclaiming because hand-in-hand -hand preschool is moving out, as you know, to the Mill Creek location. We also are in, haven't done yet, but are, are, have plans to pour a pad, right, Bruce, for, uh, for a loading dock, which is, my direction's wrong. Where would it be? Right over here. Um, and uh, not a loading dock, I shouldn't say, but a, a pull-up pad to deliver in the, in the window uh, of the, those lower rooms so that people aren't carrying this stuff up and down the stairs. Now, we know that Shepherd's Heart as, as a whole, not just the food pantry, but the ministry, is growing and expanding. And we, we are still strategically thinking and praying about what's the long-term future destination of that ministry. It may not be on this campus. In fact, we're still wrestling with, should it be connected to a campus, part of us, or a freestanding building? I think right now we're thinking it should be part of a campus. So we know this is, this is a step toward a future destination. It always kind of was. But that's why we pulled back on some of the expenses there, because we, we've been able to accomplish all we wanted to for much cheaper in the short term. Did I get that right, Bruce? Anything to add to that? They're still growing rapidly. But those, that's the update on all three campuses. Oh, Mill Creek, um, September 15th is the date they've given us to be done with construction. Um, Sterling is, you know, out there about twice a day, making sure they're on schedule. September 17th will be the first weekend that the, that the, the core team worships there. 24th again, like, like soft launch kind of thing, get, working all the bugs out of the system and the welcome teams and all of that. And then October 1st, grand opening. So, yeah. Yeah. They're doing radon testing this week uh, earlier on that, on the, if you're facing... If you're in the parking lot facing the building to your right, which would be the north, that section is the children's wing and will be the preschool area. They're doing radon testing and getting ahead there, and we've gotten, I think, agreement from the inspectors to inspect that side and give us permission for occupancy earlier than the rest so we can open a hand -hand preschool on time. Again, this is John Harper's area, and he does a fantastic job. Tom. That's right. They are storage. So um, 
dry, good storage. Right now, we, we pretty much store things down, around, down that hall in a closet, and we have to cart it all back. So we have gained the two rooms on the end of the hallway. If you walk down that, that hallway that kind of descends, I don't know what the numbers are, I can't remember. But we've gained those two rooms for um, Shepherd's Heart storage. So that's what was always intended. Not that we'd put the distribution where guests come down there, but that we get storage space there. And we are. That's where we're going to pour that slab for the trucks to pull up and the delivery system conveyor belt through the window so that people aren't having to carry these boxes up and down stairs. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> coal into your basement. Only groceries. You know, the little boy in the video saying, it was like the heaviest bag I ever lifted in my life. And I saw all those bags coming in. I saw a family uh, last week. I was, a little, I was had landed on Saturday night, came to church Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, and I uh, saw a family, and I was standing at the door kind of greeting for the very first time. And I didn't know their first time because she had like six shepherd's heart bags over her arm. And I said, well, how long have you been coming? She said, well, this is our first Sunday. I said, who gave you the bags? We're not trying to make you give, you know, first time you're here. She goes, oh, no, I just heard about it from one of my neighbors and thought it was a great thing to get involved with. So she hadn't even gone to worship yet, and she had her arm full of bags. But hey, if that's the case, here's some more bags, and here's some. <laughs> okay, any last questions? Feel free to email or call or, uh, any of us th uh, as we get ready for August. I, uh, you know, in the past, we printed it for you these, um, these ministry impact stories. Do you know these booklets that are high color and fun to look at? This year, we're going to give you something like that, but also uh, Peter Hansen, who's up there, is working on uh, a year in review of, of celebration video, which I'm very excited about to see and all that God has done. And that, that will have the capacity to live longer on our website and other places and social media to celebrate. This has been such a rich year, and it's not even over yet. So, um, Bruce, will you wrap us up? Thanks. Let's bow in prayer. King Jesus, thanks tons for sitting in these chairs and in these pews with us, for residing here at this meeting and filling this room with your glory and with your presence. Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, you would continue to empower and give us courage to neighbor well, to be uh, salt and light in our communities, and to be not ashamed of this gospel that has transformed our lives, that we might be used to impact uh, change, heart change uh, in, in our neighbors' lives in the person in the jewel parking lot, in the theaters that we go to, in the places that we reside and play and do life alongside of with others. Lord, thank you for the leadership of this church. I pray that Jeff would continue to feel the power of your presence, the, the prayers of his people, your people, this church, Chapel Street, is praying for him and his leadership. Lord, allow us all to be stronger together uh, because you have bound us together to make great impact and to love your people well. Lord, thank you for the blessing of so much that we've celebrated here this morning and pray that you'd continue to surprise us with more and more of your generosity and your grace, undeserved grace. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for giving up your Sunday afternoon. Now go and get ice cream, Owen.